Awesome. So welcome to week seven of social entrepreneurship. Tonight we're going to focus all about customer discovery and basically what is it like to get out of the building and start talking to potential customers. What are the questions you want to ask? Um, how can you go about that process to kind of build on what we talked about last week with the business model canvas uh, and taking ideas that you've been coming up with throughout the semester but now actually picking one to move forward and do a little bit more work than just thinking about it, going and talking to other people about it. Um, so tonight we're going to spend the first few minutes, again, going over the ideas we've come up with thus far, talking about the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Challenge. So that'll be in the end of March. Uh, it's a pitch competition here on campus uh, that everyone is required to sign up and pitch in. Um, and you can pick any idea that you've come up with, even an idea that somebody else has come up with. Uh, you're also welcome to form teams. This doesn't have to be a solo project. Um, you can have teams of three or four folks, and they don't have to be students in this class. But the idea is that we're going to work through the kind of lean startup methodology of doing all these customer discovery interviews so that what you learn from those interviews, you can talk about in your pitch. Even if you haven't sold any units of whatever the product or service is, you'll be able to um, say, hey, you know, we had these hypotheses uh, about it, we validated these things, we invalidated these things based on the 47 humans that we talked to. Uh, if you get into that pitch and you say, well, we did three customer discovery interviews with my mom, my roommate, and my dog, that has a lot less credibility than saying we talked to 30 or 40 or 50 folks. Um, so we'll go into today uh, what goes into customer discovery. The assignment for this week was to um, read the book by John Jabara. Uh, about mastering customer interviews. That's got a lot of great templates for questions. I also have some questions here that I'll hand out for your reference. Um, and we'll go from there. It wasn't plugged in. It wasn't plugged in. Okay. Yeah, we did. It was. I could plug it um, So, let me switch screens here to make sure that everybody knows exactly what the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Challenge is. Uh, so you have until a week or so after spring break to officially register and submit an idea, but I want you to start thinking about it now um, so that you can put in the work to um, learn more about the industry you want to pitch in, um, who your potential customers are, and things like that. And so the challenge will give you the opportunity to pitch twice on either March 30th, 31st, or April 1st, uh, and the top six undergrad teams will advance to the finals. Uh, last year we had one of the freshmen in this class actually make it to the finals. She won $1,000 um, and had a chance to pitch for up to 10 grand in the finals. So there is some legit money on the line here. Um, and if you make it to the finals, you will probably get an A in this class. Not that you aren't necessarily going to do that anyways, but it's a good way to give yourself a leg up. Uh, so putting in the work for customer discovery, uh, and we'll, after spring break, talk about how to pitch, uh, and sort of what are those public speaking skills. Um, can all be really effective for not only this event, but I, I hope you realize that throughout your entire life, you're going to have to present to people and talk to them about your ideas. And the more practice you get in a somewhat safe environment, because when you go to this pitch competition, nobody's going to throw tomatoes at you. They're not going to boo you off stage. Some of the ideas are really, really bad. You still listen, and there's five or six outside judges that'll give you feedback, and you'll pitch twice because you'll get two different rooms, so in case you bomb the first one or the judges are real, not very nice people, uh, you get a whole second room to try all over again, um, and kind of the highest six average scores will advance then to Tuesday, I think it's the 8th of April, will be like the finals in the Healy Family Student Center. Um, it's a ton of fun. Even if you don't make it to the finals, I would hope most of you would come to watch those pitches. I mean, those are, we'll have six undergrad pitching as well as six grad students pitching and give out like $35,000 for the prizes that night, um, which is not too shabby. Um, does anybody have any questions about the Georgetown Entrepreneurship Challenge or the registration process or anything like that? Yeah, Claire? You said there's several different rooms you can pitch, so you can pitch several times. Mm -hmm. So when you click the button here that says click here to apply, it brings you to this beautifully designed Airtable form, and you put in your venture name. Uh, and for undergrads, you just select an option, and you've got 6 to 7.30 on Monday, 7.30 to 9 on Monday, 6 to 7.30 on Tuesday, and the same thing on Wednesday as well. So depending on what your class schedule is and availability, as long as at least one of those time slots work, 
Um, some of the student leaders, Hannah and Lily, will do a somewhat complicated algorithm to put everybody in rooms with judges on times when they say they can come. Any other questions about the entrepreneurship challenge? <clears throat> How developed do these ideas need to be? Not that developed. Uh, the whole theme is what's your big idea? And so unlike everybody else on campus, y'all have the advantage of coming up with ideas every week leading up to this. Um, it doesn't have to be baked at all. Uh, well, ideally you put it in the oven, so to speak, but by doing the customer discovery interviews and being able to quote the exact number of interviews you've done, that's enough um, work that has gone into it. So you don't have to like have the app that people can download or have a physical product that the judges can touch and feel. By all means, if you do, that's great. You're kind of moving further along, but we'll get into um, kind of the, the nitty gritty of that as, as we get closer. Any other questions? Cool. So let's recap um, the readings for this week. Oh, did I never plug this in? Huh. Yeah, you should have told me that sooner because I was showing you all the stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, it's right here. <laughs> Boom, and watch this. This is what this website looks like. It's so beautiful. Oh uh, yeah, Entrepreneurship Challenge. It's just eship.georgetown.edu slash GEC. Here's a whole overview. This is the button you click. Ah, oh, here's a beautifully designed Airtable form. Here's a drop down with all the data. Points. But a uh, great recap. Glad we covered that. Uh, so, mastering customer interviews. Can somebody tell me one thing that they learned uh, from reading this 30 minute ebook? Kate? Um, I didn't realize that like customer discovery interviews were supposed to be like half an hour. Like, for the most part, I thought it was something kind of short. Like, but like, I guess half an hour isn't that long. But in my mind, it was like, oh, you just kind of ask, like, see what they're looking for and be done with it. But, like, it's way more in depth than that. And, and there's a whole spectrum too. I think the best ones are obviously much longer. There are still cases where you get like three questions in a minute and then they gotta go do something else. So you're like kind of bothering people in a Starbucks line. Um, you still wanna get those as well. And the goal is to get them to commit to you know talking as long as you can. I expect that like you're only supposed to really briefly talk about your actual product. And it's mostly like more about the customer because you're supposed to learn out of it more than like promote your product. Absolutely. You're not selling your goods. You are a, a researcher, really. Um, and you all also have the benefit of being Georgetown students, where you can talk to anybody and say, hey, you know, I'm a Georgetown student doing research for this idea or project. It's very different than like being a grown up and saying, I'm the CEO of this company and I want to do a customer discovery interview. They're going to feel like, don't you want to sell me something at some point? You know what I mean? Um, so use that tagline of, you know, I'm just a Georgetown student doing research for a class project or working on this idea. Most people are willing to talk to students if they think it's going to help you in your education. Um, what else did folks learn from the, uh, the book? Always asking at that if there's like anyone else you can talk to. Yeah. Um, it's really important because that, that can lead you to like further leads, whether that's customer discovery or just like connections down the line. Absolutely. Um, so making those connections is always really important, networking. Um, but in the sense of like customer discovery, just like seeing if there's other people that like would be able to answer these questions to give you more data. So yeah. Who else do you know that experiences this pain point? Boom. And there's interesting math too of like if you ask for two referrals, you're gonna like double the amount of people over time as you go through. If you ask for five referrals, you suddenly that you can talk to way more people much faster. Not that everybody's necessarily gonna have five but it is an effective way to kind of ask people to think deeper in their network of who do you know that I could talk to. So, sweet. Um, and then any insights that anybody learned from watching the 10-minute uh, video series on conducting customer interviews? One takeaway, perhaps? How did you just kind of adding on to what Joella said? Like, you're just there to listen. You're not really there to talk that much about your product. Like, you, so like, and you're not supposed to ask them, like, would you buy this? Which is, yeah, so like, don't describe your product. Don't be like, would you buy this? Yeah. yeah. You do, that's a great point that you're not selling in this. It doesn't mean you're never going to sell to these people. It just means the purpose of this interaction is not to pitch them on your product or service. Um, you do want to make sure you capture their name and email address whenever possible. 
because then maybe three to six months down the road when you have the physical product that they had specifically told you they would like, um, and I'm thinking about, for example, with my sunglasses company, we started with one model in three colors, and we did like a survey, we got a couple hundred people to respond with photos of like nine other styles, and we ended up ordering, I think, four of those styles, and then as soon as they, we got them in the US, we emailed every single person who four months previously said they, they would buy that pair of women's sunglasses, and we were like, you know, thanks so much for your feedback. We really took it to heart. Uh, we actually ordered that inventory, and you can find it now on our website. You know, here's a coupon survey 20 for 20% off because you filled out that survey for us. That's a great way to generate sales um, once you know more about them. Cool. So recapping last week, we looked at this business model canvas, and it's really this quadrant we're going to focus on. What's your value proposition? What are the customer segments, um, the channels, and relationships with them? And so we're going to go through this loop many, many, many times with the customer discovery process this semester. Um, we've got your business model canvas, things are written in pencil, you have hypotheses about what the value is you're going to deliver, what the pain point is you're solving, um, and as you talk to more and more customers, you're going to validate or invalidate those hypotheses, uh, change what you have written in some of these sections on the business model canvas, um, uh, and then pivot from time to time. Like the ideas you have today and when you start this customer discovery process is almost certainly not going to be what it looks like in a month or two. So being prepared to know that you're trying to make decisions with the best intentions now and you're definitely open to changing and pivoting and adapting in the future based on what customers tell you, not based on what you know in your head is definitely right because that's probably not the case. Um, and so as you go through customer development, you're looking uh, for problem solution fit so is the solution you want to build, does that even solve the problem that people have? Um, what is kind of your proposed MVP or minimum viable product? Um, and then thinking a little bit at this point of what are proposed funnels. And next week's lecture is going to focus all about sales. And we'll talk about sales funnels where at the top you've got all these prospects and then you qualify the prospects and they become leads and then the leads become warm leads and they're opportunities and then eventually these opportunities become paying customers. And it's like a beer bong. They funnel through and come out the bottom. The goal is to put enough customer, enough prospects at the top, because at each step, people fall out of the funnel. So if you might start with 1,000 prospects, but only 20% of them become leads, so you're down to 200 people, uh, and then only 20% of them become opportunities, you're down to 40 people, and then only 20% of them actually buy the product and become customers, that's eight. So you started with a thousand names and email addresses of humans and only eight of them bought your product. So understanding how important it is to um, think about funnels of where can you get lots of prospects, uh, whether that's in person, for example, like setting up an event or a table at an event like the farmer's market. Like I've worked with other student entrepreneurs at like a honey company and they would sell it at the farmer's market once a week. You know you're gonna get a few hundred students walking past you who might have $8 in their pocket or on their card to buy some honey. Um, then as you do customer discovery, you get to customer validation, where you're looking for product market fit. Uh, so you've got a pretty good idea about what you want to build, what the product or service is. Um, does it fit the market you're trying to solve uh, the customers there? What's your actual business model? And that really ties into the revenue model. Who are you charging money? How much are they paying? How often for it? Um, and company creation and company building, that is way down the road. We're really going to live in these first two quadrants here. Um, throughout the semester. So before you start asking questions, you want to document what you believe to be true. What are all of the things that you think are true about the customer, their pain point, the product or service you want to build? Uh, and then come up with a series of questions that can validate or invalidate that hypothesis uh, and continue to iterate on your business model, written in pencil, over time. Um, and it's helpful to, when you do these customer discovery interviews, to take notes in your field notebooks, to type them up. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have somebody else working on this project with you, one of you can be the person asking questions, the other one's the note taker. It's really helpful to divvy that up so you don't have to be scrambling to write everything down and thinking about the next question. Um, the other person can also play back like, let me just make sure I got this right, or can you confirm this is what you said? So in the, the customer discovery and validation phase, you're doing a lot of empathizing. You're going to turn on your empathy machine and really put yourself in the shoes of the customers. And now for some of you, the idea you decide to move forward with 
it might be a problem or a pain point that you yourself face. So it's going to be pretty easy to empathize because um, you have lots of friends with speakers that they can't all, you know, sync together and play the same music. You know exactly what that pain point is. But if you're trying to do something that helps kids and it's really selling to parents, that's a little bit harder. But you need to think about what is their experience like um, with this problem and kind of define and ideate or iterate on it. So again, reiterating this cycle, we're going to go around with there's a hypothesis, you're going to test your hypothesis. All of you at this point are entrepreneurial scientists. All right, think about like bio labs you did in high school where you had to document what are the ingredients, what are the steps you went through, what's the data you collected, uh, and then what are your key takeaways, what you learned from that lab or experiment. That's what we're doing in the real world. Um, I have not really done a bio lab in a couple decades. However, asking people questions and thoughtfully learning and extracting learnings or insights from them, that's something I do almost daily. So these are really useful skills to get better at asking questions uh, and verifying what you believe to be true uh, and also identifying what's your riskiest assumption. So at the beginning of this process, you're laying out all of your assumptions, what do you believe to be true. You want to identify if I have five things that I think are true. If one of them is wrong, which one of them, if wrong, is going to screw me over the most? Like, and I can't think of a good example right now to just throw it at you, but process the idea that I'm assuming all these things are true, and if something is wrong, and then 50% of the people I thought would buy it are not going to buy it as a result, that's a pretty risky assumption. And so you want to identify questions that you can ask in this customer discovery process to validate or invalidate the riskiest assumption. Once you validate it through 20 interviews, 19 of them say, hey, yeah, this is true, great. You don't have to ask that question as much anymore. Go on to the next riskiest assumption. Because even if you have a full-grown company with 30 employees, you still have risky assumptions, and you always want to be allocating time and resources to validate or invalidate um, those resources. And your hypotheses must be falsifiable, which means uh, the opposite of it can't be completely ridiculous or absurd. And it's really important that you don't ask questions that lead the witness and like make them want to con have confirmation bias uh, and just agree with what you're saying. Um, and there are a few ways to do this, and we'll get into a list of questions that you can ask. But like. Don't ask questions like, wouldn't it be nice if you had this exact thing that I'm designing and want to tell you why it's so amazing for you? That's not the type of question. And a lot of the questions you want to ask are actually historical focused on like, what have they done in the past 12 months to solve this problem or, you know, let's say uh, you've got a sock company, for example. So you might ask, hey Cody, in the past 12 months, how many times have you purchased new socks? All right, not a good customer. Um, hey, Tori, in the past 12 months, how many times have you purchased new socks? All right. Uh, in the past 12 months, how much money have you spent buying new socks? Per sock or total? Okay. Per sock. <laughs> the expensive per socks. No, value packs. All right. Uh, what stores did you go to uh, to find those value packs? Um, All right. Was the price or the quality of the socks more important to you? Um, let, me re let, me, let me rephrase it. On a scale of one to five, how important was quality of the socks? And how important was price on a scale of one to five? All right, cool. And there's a trick here, too, of asking one to five scales instead of one to ten scales. Um, if you ever ask somebody from a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about something, 7 is not allowed to be an answer anymore. 7 is the official cop-out answer. If it's not actually good, it's not actually bad. If you tell somebody you can't say 7, it has to be a 6 or an 8. There's a big difference between an 8, which was a 4 in this case, or a 6, which is a 3. And so when you say 1 through 5, you get rid of that 7 in the middle option. There's also a concept of a net promoter score, which is a question that almost every company should ask their customers, and it's basically, uh, you know, on a scale of 1 to 5, how likely are you, or on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to recommend the, our product or service to your friends or colleagues? It's a very simple question. You'll often get this like one sentence email survey from different brands. And the reason they do this is because a 9 or a 10 is considered a net promoter. Like plus 1, they're definitely going to promote you, they're going to tell people. A 7 or 8 
uh, is neutral, and then a six or lower is negative. So they're, they're what's called a detractor, somebody who does not like your brand, doesn't use the product or service. If you do it on a one to five scale, it's real easy. Five is good, four is neutral, three and lower is bad. Um, and so it makes it easier for them to give you actually useful input because that seven is really a waste. Um, so price and quality was important. Um, did you ever consider looking online to buy socks? Um, no. Okay. Um, what, uh, what brands of socks have you ever owned? Um, Nike. Jesus. Okay. Um, cool. Um, what, uh, I'm kind of making this, who else in your family, what other brands of socks do, does your family members own? Oh, nice. That was Georgetown Long. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so, a quick aside on Bombas. He, he spoke at a Georgetown Alumni Weekend a couple years ago, and for every pair they sell of socks, they donate a pair to a homeless person, which is an awesome mission. They've donated like more than 5 million pairs of socks. Um, and somebody during the Q&A was just like, how do you decide like which pairs of your cool, fancy running socks to give to homeless people? So, oh, that's a great question. Uh, we don't actually donate any of the socks that we sell to you as consumers to homeless people. And I paused and everyone was like, what? Uh, we actually did customer discovery interviews with more than a thousand homeless people and found out the pain points that they had because they don't have access to a washing machine, so they often wear the same pair of socks for like a week in a row. So we designed our socks to not have to be washed as often, to not hold scents or like smelliness in them as long, and to have disinfectant things to not hold like athlete's foot viruses and like all of these things that made the socks better for their um, beneficiary that's getting these free socks. And my jaw was like on the ground at how thoughtful and like deliberate they were to not only have this impact and help homeless people have socks, but to not just give them another thing they're making already. Um, and so there's several lessons in there about if you bake impact into the organization, not only doing customer discovery with your customers who buy from you, also thinking about the people who are going to receive that impact and how it can help them more. Um, Cool. I think that's enough about socks. This is a great anecdote about the segue, which was able to raise a hundred million dollars and built the infrastructure and factory to manufacture 10,000 segways per week. And in two years, they only sold 6,000. That was a terrible waste of money. And one of the reasons was because they skipped this step. Okay, they just assumed the technology is cool, people are going to want to ride segways. When's the last time you saw somebody ride a segway? Airport, maybe security guards, maybe weird tourists around the mall, they like come in a pack and that's about it. Um, and it's really important that you don't skip uh, or underestimate the value of this customer discovery process. So you want to make sure what you're building is actually solving somebody's pain point and it's a, a need to have, not a nice to have. Like, maybe it would be nice to have a Segway. Now I see like kids on these one wheel skateboard motorized things. They look cooler to me than Segways. Um, and if you come up with a solution that doesn't have a problem, and doesn't have a, a painful problem, people aren't gonna spend money uh, to buy it. So now we're gonna go into some best practices for actually doing these customer discovery interviewers. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you can have a buddy to be an interviewer and a note taker, it works really well and also gives you the ability to kind of ping pong back and forth. Face-to-face um, -face is like 10 times better than any virtual things. If it does have to be via technology, try to do something that you can see their face and they can see yours, whether that's Skype, Google Hangouts, Zoom. Um, Definitely don't do emails. Like this assignment is not about like making a survey monkey or a Google form and then blasting it out to everybody. You need to actually talk, process what they're saying, and perhaps adapt the next questions you're asking based on the previous response you got. Um, be be grateful as well. You want to say thank you for your time. Um, you might even do like a you know hey you do a five to thirty minute customer discovery interview. You're entered to win a raffle for a twenty five dollar Starbucks gift card. Maybe $5 Starbucks gift card, depending on your budget. Um, another way to get these interviews is to hang out at Starbucks and offer to buy people a coffee if they'll spend X minutes talking with you about this thing. Um, 
And again, you're focusing on their needs and pain points. You want to gain insights and understand um, things about the market, hypotheses that you want to validate or invalidate. You are not selling. I'm going to teach you next week how to sell. You're going to learn lots of things about selling, and you're going to apply none of them to this customer discovery process. It's more like you're a researcher going on a trip uh, and just trying to collect as much information as possible. Um, there's also a scenario where you can video um, record the audio, if that makes sense. Never do it without telling them you're going to videotape it, but like if you don't have a note taker, like, hey, is it okay if I um, record this? Um, I want to make sure I don't miss anything, uh, and that way I don't have to take all the notes you know, while we're talking. So that's totally fine, but don't pull a Richard Mix in and just like have video <laughs> reporters there. Um, so again, you're starting with kind of all the way over here, what's your persona hypotheses, um, who's the customer, what types of people do you want to talk to. Uh, it's useful to come up with a first question to ask where if they say no to it, you know they're not your customer and you don't have to waste anybody's time and keep going. Um, if she was like, I only wear sand, or Cody for example, I stopped talking to Cody. It's like, he hasn't bought socks in the past year, don't need to do a customer discovery interview. Um, and so having a couple upfront questions that can kick people out and realize like this isn't somebody I need to talk to. You could also though, I could have asked Cody, hey Cody, do you know if any of your roommates have bought socks in the past year? Would you mind putting me in touch with them? Uh, so still ask for referrals even if you identify that person isn't a customer. Um, what's your value hypothesis, um, the usability, and we're not really at the growth hypothesis stage yet. That's once you've found some problem solution fit and you're feeling pretty good about your um, product market fit. Uh, your growth hypothesis is really, it's not a product market fit, it's a product channel fit. So what's the channel in which you're selling this product and how can you like 10x or 100x things through this specific marketing channel? Oh, base of the pyramid is what we're working on. This is the foundation uh, to make sure that you got a problem and pain point that you are clearly observed you're be able to provide value for the users and customers and ultimately build a successful business. If you don't set this foundation, you're gonna build a house of cards that's gonna get knocked down by one person on a Segway roller by it. Uh, so who do you wanna to talk to? Everybody. Everybody in different roles. If Tori was like, I actually never bought the socks, my mom bought the socks, I probably wanna to talk to her mom. You know, you wanna understand who's the budget owner, who's the payer, um, who's the recommender. Uh, and one question I was thinking about was like, do you ever see anybody on social media who wears socks and does that inspire you or influence you to want to buy a certain product? Or like what celebrities promoting products have, that's interesting, uh, what celebrities or influencers have influenced your decision to buy a product in the past 12 months? And where did you see that celebrity using the product? What was the product? Um, how much did that product cost? How much had you previously spent for that type of a product? Uh, what would you somewhat arbitrarily say was the financial value of that influencer using the product? And what I'm really doing here is customer discovery on how valuable is influencer marketing. And is it worth trying to find like athletes or hot models on Instagram to like take selfies with a product and tag your brand? Um, I had a lot of people take photos wearing sunglasses and like tag us on social media. We sold like zero pairs as a result of that. I mean, we had some pretty awesome athletes. We had like Sports Illustrated swimsuit models. We had people get like hundreds and sometimes thousands or tens of thousands of likes and sold almost no sunglasses as a result. So this is a little bit further along the process. You've got this idea, you've got this product. You're trying to do customer discovery about your marketing channels and how you get the product and the brand in front of people. Um, and there may be some things that don't directly lead to sales, but they do lead to impressions. Cody? Did you have to like make shit, like advertise it as an ad? Um, no. Yeah. Uh, this was also circa 2015 before the rules were less strict on like, is this a business promoted thing on Instagram and is this a business account versus personal things? Um, yeah, but we, we did not. And I also, Except for small examples, never paid anybody. It was just like, I might send you free sunglasses, and then I would literally, if you were good at it, write exactly what you want them to say. So this is, again, kind of like that telephone game from kindergarten. Don't ask people who are going to promote your product or be recommenders to make up how they describe it. You want them to be willing to copy and paste or like click to tweet the exact thing you send them, make it super easy. 
Um, and so that they are framing your product or service in the right way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, so. It's kind of off the topic, but still relates to sunglasses. So what if I, I, I saw the thing happen in like Silicon Valley where people sell stuff, but they charge you only in seven days unless you return it back. So yeah, so it's like, so the thing they did it with was a mattress yeah. and a person bought the mattress, the card wasn't charged at all. And then they had like seven days to try it out if they liked it and if they would send it back, they would be, they would not be charged, but otherwise they would be charged. So it's like, uh, I was thinking, how can you scale that? You know, because with mattress, yeah. it's one thing, but like with retail and fashion. Well, and there's a lot of tech products that do that as well that will give you a seven day free trial. And, but you have to pay, you have to give your credit card on day zero and you get it and then, actually this happened to me this month. Uh, I signed up for eForms.com to like learn how to make a lease to rent a house. I don't want to do that. I filled all these forms, they printed out this great thing. That was great. I didn't go to the website again for the next six days. And then I got a notification from the bank like, hey, you just got charged $39.99 for eForms.com membership. And I was like, I forgot about that. This is not ideal. However, I called them up. And there's a lesson here about customer service because I called the guy, I was like, hey man, I totally forgot about this. I'm not actually using this. I use it once for one form. Like, can you please cancel my account? I would greatly appreciate a refund. And he gave me a refund. And like, there's a lesson there, like don't be a business that makes money on like suckers for getting to cancel it. Like if that's your business model, it's not that good. You want to have a product that's so good that people want to spend the $39.99 a month or whatever it is. Um, like some people will give you a 30 day free trial. Like, you want to design something that's sticky enough so people come back and keep using it. And if people accidentally get billed, like the day the day after you charge somebody money, they're like, hey, this thing, I actually don't use it, can I have my money back? Give them their money back. Um, because I'm telling you about eForms right now in a very positive way. And if you do need to come up with a lease to rent a house, I'd recommend eForms.com. However, if they just stole my 39 bucks and wouldn't give it back and were really rude to me, I'd be like, screw those guys, don't use them, go check out something else. So it's worth thinking about the positive word of mouth um, that you can get if you have a good customer experience. Now thinking about these people, um, what are, this is kind of building on like, the decision maker will make the decision to buy it. Uh, some of these personas may be the same human. In more complicated sales, they're often different humans. They may even be different departments with multiple humans in them if you're doing business to business sales. Um, the saboteur is usually somebody else, often a significant other or a roommate or somebody in the store with them who think about going to try on clothes, you try on a shirt, you come out and your friend's like, you look ridiculous, you're not going to buy it. If you come out and it's like, oh my god, you look so beautiful, I love it, oh it's so soft, that's so great, you're way more likely to buy it. So finding out ways to reduce the number of saboteurs, the things that they're sabotaging it about. Um, and getting more of them to be recommenders and say, hey, this is great. Uh, and recommend and understanding too who owns the money and like if you're swiping a car, is it your hard earned money from your work study job or is it mom and dad's credit card? They could be the ones that are actually paying for it depending on what that relationship is like and how close attention do they pay to what you're